<clears throat> Hi, everybody. We are looking at chapter five this week on identifying good measurement. So we'll talk a little bit about what are some of the different ways that we can measure variables. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about reliability. Uh, so are the scores consistent? We've been talking about validity. So now we'll add the element of reliability into the equation. And then we'll talk a little bit more about validity and some different types of validity that we can add to what we already know. Uh, does it measure what it's supposed to measure? So continuing to add on to our knowledge base that we have so far. So if we jump into this, uh, there are lots of different ways that you can measure a variable, right? And we've been talking about this a little bit already. We've talked about operationalizing our variables and talking about conceptual definitions and variables and so on. But whenever we are trying to measure something, we always start with like a, a construct or some kind of theoretical idea that we could call a conceptual variable. And again, we've talked about this a little bit already. And then from there, we're going to create an operational definition that really uh, kind of uh, stipulates how it's going to be measured or manipulated. So for example, if we were interested in the conceptual variable of happiness, or we could call that somebody's subjective well-being, we can operationally define that in a lot of different ways. Uh, we could operationally define that as maybe how many times somebody smiles in a given day or maybe how they respond to five items on a seven point scale with one being strongly disagree and seven being strongly agree. And so we could give people questions like, in most ways, my life is close to ideal or the conditions of my life are excellent. And they would rate their responses on a scale of one to seven. So whenever we're trying to measure something, we start with that kind of lofty conceptual idea or construct. And then we narrow it down into something that we can operationally define, that we can have uh, very clearly laid out for us, and that will help us decide how we're going to measure and then manipulate that variable. Now, there are three common ways that we can measure um, a variable. Once we have operationally defined it, we can use a self-report measure, an observational measure, or even a physiological measure. These are kind of the, the common ways that we can measure something that we have operationally defined. When we do a self-report measure, we record people's answers to questions about themselves. And this is typically done as part of a questionnaire or an interview, or uh, maybe you, you fill out a form of some type. So for example, with that subjective well-being question that we were interested in, you know, rate yourself on these following items, that would be a self-report measure. These are very, very commonly used. People can do them privately, um, over the phone, by email, by regular mail, right? They can be done in a lot of different methods and gather a lot of information very quickly. We can also measure somebody through an op observational kind of method where we record observable behaviors. So uh, as I mentioned a second ago, maybe if we were interested in happiness, how many times a person smiles? That would be a concrete observable behavior that we could record. How many times in a given day do you smile? So observing somebody and recording the data. Or we could do a physiological measure where we record some kind of biological data. Maybe we record the muscle movements of the face using an EMG or uh, something that we would measure physiologically in your system. And when we're trying to decide which one is best, it really kind of comes down to what we're studying and what is possible and doable and, uh, and smart in order to make those decisions. And preferably all three of them would show similar patterns. If we were to measure happiness, as we've been talking about in this example, we would hope that we would gather similar data from the three different types of measures that we might use. So it really comes down to, you know, which one is accessible and doable for you um, and what are you trying to, to figure out. A few other things that we can add here when we're, we're measuring variables, uh, we talk a little bit about scales of measurement and, and these are with quantitative variables that we are looking at. Uh, and so we can look at a couple of different types of scales that we might use when we're measuring data and we're trying to gather that information through these different types of measures. We can use ordinal scales, interval scales, and ratio scales. An ordinal scale is when we have a ranked order, like uh, think of a race, right? People are first, second, 
or third, right? Numericals represent some kind of rank order. The distance between them might not be equal, um, but think about the order of people finishing in a race or rank your top favorite um, 10 movies from least favorite to most favorite or candy bars from most favorite to least favorite. I think Snickers might be up there at the top of my list as a side note. Uh, but when we're looking at an ordinal scale, we're ranking things in order. Uh, and think again about a race or placing in a race. With an interval scale, the numbers um, represent equal distances between levels. There might not necessarily be a true zero. So IQ, for example, we can't necessarily say twice as intelligent because the, there might not be a true zero that we're looking at. But with interval scales, we're looking at subsequent numbers representing equal distances. So IQ score, shoe size, the degree of agreement on a scale between one and seven. So there's some kind of interval distance between two things, uh, but we can't always say that there's an equal distance or that there is a true zero that we could measure as part of that scale. A ratio scale, the last one, is when numerals represent equal intervals and there is a true zero. An exam score, for example, we could say that you answer twice as many problems correctly. Um, or so the number of exam questions you answered, the number of seconds to respond to a computer task, your height in inches, um, or they say centimeters on the little chart right here. So here we have equal, um, equal distances, there is a true zero, and we can say twice as many or three times as many. So we can use different ways of measuring information and then different scales to kind of um, quantitate whatever information that we've gathered through the measurements that we have used. A term that's really big in uh, here in this chapter is looking at something that we can call reliability. We've talked a little bit about validity, um, are things kind of measuring what they're supposed to. Uh, reliability is a little bit different, but it's just as important. Reliability is crucial just as validity is crucial when we're looking at uh, some kind of measurement that we're going to use. Reliability, think about if somebody is reliable, you can count on them, they're consistent. Uh, and that's consistency is really another big word to use for reliability. It refers to how consistent um, a research study is or a test is that we're using. How does it kind of stay the same or give us consistent and a kind of predictable responses? Now we can use a couple of different methods in order to evaluate the reliability of a test or a measure. We can use a scatter plot to look at how close the, the data points are to each other, just like we would do with a correlation. Or we could use Pearson's R, that correlation co coefficient, to also evaluate reliability. In a sense, we're looking at how strongly does uh, a test correlate with itself. Or maybe it does a test correlate with the behavior that it's trying to measure or with another test measuring the same thing. So we can look at scatter plots or graphs, and we can also look at a correlation coefficient or that um, Pearson's R to evaluate the reliability of a measure. There are multiple types of reliability, just like there are multiple types of validity. Um, and we'll talk about a few of them here. One of them, a very commonly uh, talked about type of reliability is called test retest reliability, where we are hoping that we get consistent scores every time we use a measure. So if we were having you watch somebody and evaluate how many times they do something, that hopefully you were getting a similar response. Or if you took that subjective well-being inventory, hopefully you're yielding very consistent scores every time you use the measure. So if we gave you a test and then we retested you, you should ideally score very consistently or reliably with what you took before. We can also have something called inter-rater reliability. Consistent scores no matter who does the measuring. So with this one, let's say that we have a panel of people who are all observing um, how many times somebody smiles. We would hope that the panel are all getting very similar results because maybe they have been trained to look for specific things in a very concrete way. So when we have inner rater reliability, everybody is measuring the same thing and getting very consistent, similar results um, on whatever it is that they're observing and measuring. We also hope to have good internal reliability. 
when the participant provides consistent patterns of responses, regardless of how the researcher has phrased the question. And this is something that we would look at quite a bit on like a self-report measure if you took some kind of questionnaire or inventory, but how strong is the internal reliability of a measure? Are you getting consistent, reliable results regardless of what, what it is that the researchers are, are doing? So reliability is a really crucial element. You want tests to be valid and you want them to be reliable um, or measures would be another word that we could use um, so that the information that they give us is worthwhile and meaningful and consistent. We can use a scatter plot to evaluate reliability. So just like with an association claim, we can measure this uh, through a scatter plot or through Pearson's R. So evidence for reliability is basically a special type of association claim. As I mentioned, we're measuring how much something associates either with itself or with another measure that's measuring something very similar. So in a sense, it's a correlation. We're looking at um, how you know, strongly correlated or related to each other are the first test and the second test, or the two different people who are rating the same responses. So we can look at just like with correlation, you know, how steep is the slope? How close together are the data points? And examine those two variables as they relate to each other. So for example, um, if we're looking at reliability of different observers, right, I'm observing Matt's ratings and Mark's ratings. You can see that there's a pretty decently strong correlation between Matt and Mark, right? They're rating things very similarly. Or Peter and Mark, a little bit less, right? The data points are kind of more spread out. The slope isn't as steep. So you can look at these things and kind of gather information about how strong the correlation of reliability is between two different measures or between two different evaluators or raters. So this one, right, um, as I kind of mentioned a second ago, right, this one here would be a much more reliable indicator. It's got a steeper slope um, and the data points are much closer together. We can also use Pearson's R, that correlation coefficient to evaluate reliability. Right, so if we were using that correlation coefficient, remember this is a, a numerical indicator ranging from negative one to zero to positive one. And it's gonna describe how close the dots on a scatter plot are to the line drawn through them. Right, so just looking at this, notice how the, the dots, the little data points are kind of more spread out versus if you look at this one, they're very clustered together. And so you can look at it visually or you can look at it through a number. Right, so 0 0.56 versus 0 0.93. 0 0.93, very close to one, right? This has a very, very strong correlation coefficient versus this one is a little more spread out um, and closer to about uh, 0 0.56. So we can look at it as a graph or we can look at it as um, a number, but just like we would with a correlation, that, that cor co correlation coefficient, that's a, a a difficult one to say, say that five times fast. Right? Um, another example here, just to kind of look at this, right? We can also look at the slope direction and the strength, right? So with 0.93, as we mentioned, these are very close uh, together, but we can see if things are sloping one way or the other, if they're relatively flat. And that can give us a lot of information about how strong the reliability of a measure would be. If we go back to validity, right? Validity was something that we talked um, a lot about in a previous chapter. Validity, um, does something measure what it's been designed to measure? And we talked about the four big validities, right? Internal validity, construct validity, statistical validity, and external validity. And reliability is a big part of these. Reliability and validity are very closely connected to each other. Um, and you actually can't have one without the other, which we'll talk a little bit about in a moment. But there are a couple other types of validity worth measuring. Uh, things like face and content validity, criterion convergent and discriminant validity. Uh, so just as there are multiple types of reliability, right, there are also, also multiple types of validity. And, and we're really looking here at construct validity in this chapter. How well are we measuring or operationalizing a construct? And when we do that, 
you know, are we actually measuring what we wanted to? Does it appear that way? Um, and then are we getting consistent, reliable results? They're all kind of intertwined with each other uh, in a very kind of delicate way. So let's look at a few of these different types um, of validity and we'll look at face and content validity. Does it look like a good measure? On the surface of things, does it look like it's going to actually measure what it's been designed to do? Face validity is, does it look like you, what you want it to be, right? On the surface, does it look like it's going to measure what it's designed to measure? This is very, very subjective. And I imagine you have um, started to take an exam in a class before, and you get a very quick impression of the face validity of that exam. In just a few questions, you can tell very quickly, is this test fair? Is it actually designing uh, or measuring what it's been designed to measure? And if it doesn't appear that way, then it probably has relatively poor face validity. Content validity is, does the measure contain all the parts that your theory says it should contain? And again, both of these are relatively subjective. You're making up your own mind and it's kind of your opinion. But for example, if we're measuring intelligence, do we have multiple aspects of intelligence? Do we have reasoning and planning? Are we, are we including everything that we believe should make up the content of whatever subject that we are, are measuring. When we're also talking about validity, we have a, another one called criterion validity. Does the measure associate with a concrete behavioral outcome that should be associated with it? Right, so when we're measuring GPA, does GPA correlate with exam scores? Does um, an aptitude test correlate with the behavior that it's been designed to measure. So we're looking at does the criterion, the idea that we're studying, measure with a concrete outcome. So if we're studying somebody's intelligence and we give them an intelligence test, does their intelligence score actually correlate with specific behaviors that we associate with intelligence? And we would hope so. If it doesn't, then we probably have fa uh, fairly poor criterion related validity. A couple other things that we can talk about, uh, known group paradigm, uh, other evidence for criterion validity when we're trying to look at does um, a measure predict or kind of uh, correlate with behaviors we would expect. We can look at what's called a known groups paradigm, whether scores on a measure can distinguish among a set of groups whose behavior is already confirmed, already known. Right, so for example, if we gave a bunch of patients, a bunch of clients, a BDI test, BDI stands for Beck Depression Inventory. So let's say we gave a bunch of people who um, were dealing with depression, a Beck Depression Inventory test. We would hope that those people, because we already know that they are depressed, that they would score higher on depression because we already know that they have depression. Right, so if we are examining criterion related validity, we can check this against a group that we already have confirmed to have the behavior that we are interested in. We can also look at um, convergence and discriminant validity. Does the pattern that we are measuring and noticing, does it actually make sense? Convergent validity is a self-report measure um, should correlate more strongly with self-report measures of a similar construct. So if we gave somebody a Beck depression inventory test, and then we gave them another test measuring depression, we would hope that there would be a strong correlation between the two tests, that they kind of converge on each other, that they are very similar. If we gave one person a uh, Stanford Binet intelligence test, and then we gave them the Wexler adult intelligence test. Those are the two most common ones that we use. We would hope that they would show very similar scores or patterns on those two tests, that they would strongly correlate with each other because they're measuring similar constructs, because they're measuring similar ideas. So we want things to converge and, and have this um, correlation that's more strongly there with constructs that are similar and then we would want the reverse, right? We would want discriminant or divergent validity where they should correlate less strongly with measures of different constructs. So let's say that we were interested in depression 
and we measure physical health problems, we would hope that the two would be a little bit divergent or discriminant because they aren't capturing the same construct, the same data. So we can look at it in either way. How well do they line up or how strongly do they indicate that they're different? And both of those pieces of information can give us a lot of uh, kind of ideas about the validity and also reliability of a measure that we are, are using. So just to um, kind of wrap this up, the relationship between reliability and validity, as I mentioned, they are very directly intertwined with each other. Uh, but kind of an interesting, you can have one but not the other um, scenario here. A measure can be less valid than it is reliable, but it cannot be more valid than it is reliable, if that makes sense. If a measure doesn't even correlate with itself, if it's not associated within itself, then how could it be correlated with other variables? So in other words, another way of putting this, reliability is necessary in order um, to gather validity, but it's not sufficient for validity. So you can have something that is reliable, but it cannot be more valid than it is reliable. You have to have the two kind of intertwined with each other. As I mentioned, they are definitely very, uh, very, very connected. All right. So that is the end of the lecture for chapter five. Make sure that you get going on all of the required materials for this week. Uh, make sure that you're reading the chapter, doing the discussion and everything else that's due before the weekly deadline. And I will see you all next week when we move on uh, to our next, our next topic.